Welcome to the Business of Indie Games 2018. Uh, my name is Simon Bailey and I'm here today with Glenn Gregory uh, of Microsoft. He's the Senior Global Product Manager at Microsoft uh, Idea Xbox. Glenn has uh, run the global marketing program uh, since just a few months after its inception. Uh, having been at Microsoft uh, for 10 years prior to the ID Xbox program, he worked as a global senior product manager for various first party titles, including uh, Rise Son of Rome, uh, Connect Star Wars, Lips and others. At Sierra before that, he led the marketing uh, for Crash and Spyro and various other licensed uh, IPs. Like many industry veterans, he got his start uh, in testing at, uh, and QA at Activision. A huge fan of indie gaming, uh, Glenn prides himself on playing nearly every uh, ID Xbox game released. Other hobbies include collecting and playing old analog synthesizers and playing with his two awesome children. Glenn, welcome. Thank you. Great to have you here. We're going to focus today on how developers can maximize marketing efforts, best practice and discoverability. Um, but please, uh, before we dive in, uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your background in gaming and what you do at Microsoft? Yeah, absolutely. Um, as you mentioned, I, you know, I started uh, uh, in the game industry in, in QA or test uh, uh, a couple of years at Activision, working on some some really great games, you know, Return to Castle, Wolfenstein, and Jedi Outcast, that kind of thing. And, and then I uh, went over to Vivendi. Um, Vivendi uh, has gone, you know, went through a number of name changes and conglomerations and that kind of thing. And at the time, they owned um, a company called Knowledge Adventure, in addition to Sierra and Blizzard. And so I went from working on Return to Castle, Wolfenstein, to Jumpstart Second Grade. And so that was quite a uh, <laughs> quite a change. Um, but as Vivendi kind of consolidated uh, operations down into their Los Angeles offices, um, I got to work on some more exciting stuff and eventually uh, moved over into marketing and um, worked on a lot of uh, uh, licensed properties, you know, film, film industry properties, Crash and Spyro, as you mentioned, uh, Ghostbusters, some other fun stuff. And then uh, eventually ended up at Microsoft about 10 years ago. Um, I was in first party when I first uh, started working here. Um, worked on a number of different titles, uh, did, did uh, this uh, um, singing franchise called Lips, uh, which was quite a fun, um, but if you, you know, have ever listened to me sing, you might wonder why they put me on that, that franchise, but it was entertaining <laughs> to work on, a uh, lot of interesting licensing challenges there, and then um, did a lot of the Connect stuff around that launch, uh, did Rise and Rome around the Xbox One launch, and then... Um, uh, after a very brief stint in our Xbox Entertainment Studio uh, group, where I got the uh, uh, the chance to go down to um, to the dig where they were digging out the old Atari um, ET cartridges for a uh, for a documentary they were making, so out of out of this uh, this landfill, that was that was pretty uh, pretty interesting uh, to be part of that project. But after that, uh, the ID at Xbox program started taking off, and um, it, it was a good time for me to make a transition and I've kind of always loved indie gaming and, and uh, uh, got to talk to, uh, to Chris Charles and some other people and um, was really excited about what the, the vision for the program was and it seemed like a good fit for me. And, um, you know, we didn't have a marketing team working on it at the time. So I kind of, you know, got in and, and uh, decided how we were going to handle it from a marketing point of view because um, there was a you know, a fair bit of controversy about whether it should be a totally self-service program or whether we should treat it as, you know, a program that we brand, you know, ID at Xbox as a consumer brand or whether it should really be more um, a program that facilitates these games coming to the platform where they would be treated like every other game. And so there was quite an opportunity there to, um, to be part of that process and define how we, we treated the program within our organization. Um, and when it started, you know, we were doing one game a month, one game every six weeks, something like that. Some were pretty small. And uh, we're to the point now where um, we do uh, roughly 350, 400 games a year um, through ID Xbox. And if you kind of look at the, the the overall kind of volume of games that come through um, uh, Xbox, more than half of them, I think it's around, if I remember correctly, last year it was around 60%, actually came through the ID at Xbox program, um, which is, you know, the, the growth in four years, four and a half years has been, 
you know, exponential, um, yes, not yes. only volume of games, but also from, from the size of the program. You know, we've got uh, very small games that are developed by an individual who might, you know, it might be a passion project and they work on it for, for you know, a couple of years by themselves to extremely large, huge, you know, franchises like, you know, um, uh, you know, Warframe and, and Fortnite and, uh, you know, games like that that come through the program, Rocket League. Um, so it's, it's, it's quite a, uh, it's quite an interesting business to work on these days and, um, very exciting, lots of new stuff happening all the time, which is great. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, you must have a, a full range of titles uh, from, you know, you, you say that individuals right through to what, what are some of the largest, uh, more successful titles on the platform? Um, so a lot of the, uh, you know, the, the, not, not to get too in the, in the, in the ditch in terms of the relationship, but you know, a lot of, a lot of games that don't require digital, or don't require a retail disc come through ID to Xbox because it's more of a natural fit to, to how they distribute. So we, we get games like Fortnite, which is obviously, you know, probably the biggest game in the world right now, um, came through ID to Xbox. No, I can't and, get my son off of it at the moment. Oh yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's funny. My, my kids, uh, are just kind of getting into gaming and they play the, the usual ones that you'd expect for kids. And now they want to play Fortnite. And I'm like, where did that come from? But it's, it's really exciting to see, you know, that just blow up into this massive, you know, kind of cultural moment. So, yeah, I mean, you know, that's obviously probably the biggest one. You know, Warframe is another free to play game that's been um, uh, wildly successful. You know, fantastic team there has been uh, uh, doing some great things with that, that, that game to kind of, you know, keep re-envisioning it, re, you know, uh, revitalizing it and, and, you know, making it relevant, you know, for the last few years. And it's, it's been great to have that one. Um, I mean, you know, we have quite a few, I'd say Roblox is an interesting title that um, uh, is just massive with kids. I don't know if you have kids, but um, it's, it's, it's a huge franchise that, you know, that, that, that kids are, are passionate about. And, uh, you know, yeah, um, my guys are in their teens. So what age group are you talking about? Then? Well, it seems, you know, as far as I can tell, um, you know, they're, they're, you know, my kids are, are younger, they're uh, five and eight, and they love playing it, you know, especially online with their cousins, and that kind of thing. And I think there's a huge fan base there. Um, and as far as I understand, I think uh, older kids, teens, you know, and people in their early 20s, really get into it from the creative point of view, because it's very easy um, to kind of um, uh, start making your own, you know, uh, games in there and, and publishing them. And some people actually make some, some really good money as creators. Um, but I think it's kind of an evolution from the, the idea of uh, a game like Minecraft where you're building using the tools within the game to Roblox where you're actually kind of programming almost to the point of building a game like you would in say Unity or something like that. You know, I think it's kind of a hybrid there. Yeah, it's kind absolutely. of interesting seeing the, you know, the range of people who work on or, or who are kind of passionate about that franchise. But some of the other games that aren't free to play, I mean, if you think of, you know, Rocket League came through ID and Xbox, that's a pretty, pretty exciting game. It's done, you know, continues to do really well. They keep adding new content uh, to it. Uh, Ark Survival Evolved, you know, this, those uh, Studio Wildcard guys are just up the street here, and it's been fantastic to see the success those guys have uh, had. Astroneer is another local team. Um, and uh, it's it's uh, the game still in game preview. Um, they had some cool announcements this year at E3 about what they're adding to the game as they kind of build towards their their 1.0 release. And uh, it's been great to see that one be really successful. Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, I mean that, that that's a wonderful resume, and uh, there seems to be so much opportunity there on the platform. Um, are are you guys uh, approachable? Is it easy for developers to contact you and show you their wares uh, what's the pathway to get something on board yeah I mean you know I'd like to say that we're extremely approachable um, you know in reality there are, we have a limited number of people working on the team and and you know we we try and uh, you know we try and be as responsive as possible and sometimes it's not as easy as you'd, you'd like it to be but uh, you know the, the the easiest way to probably approach us is to really just go to the uh, I did Xbox page on the Xbox uh, dot com website and uh, and fill out an application or you know express interest there and that'll get you in our system and then people you know can start contacting you and you can start contacting people through our program we kind of work um, you know we have a number of aliases that people can reach out to and then they get filtered to the appropriate person depending on what kind of question that you have um, but I, I think you know we have a, we have a number of people that attend shows you know we go to all the 
the major shows. Um, and you know, if you kind of just reach out to us through those, through that um, uh, page, and let us know if you're going to be exhibiting there. Like, you know, Gamescom is coming up. If, if someone's showing a game at Gamescom, they can reach out, and and uh, we'll do our best to try and uh, drop by and and say hi and check it out and talk to you about about the program. Um, we're usually pretty good about that. I think we have half a dozen or pe so people going to Gamescom. Um, and you know, uh, the you know, we also kind of just cruise the floor at those kind of shows and check out the games and try and try and meet people and you know make contacts that way as well. Oh, that's great. Thank you. I mean, um, as as I understand it, um, you know, the Xbox ID program is set up for uh, independent independent developers to publish uh, themselves. Um, but you also have the um, creators program. Uh, how does that differ from the uh, idea xbox program please yeah that's a, that's a great question the, the creators club came online uh <clears throat> what about a year ago a little more um as a as a solution for people who um want to get a game on the platform but uh haven't kind of gotten to the point where they can publish a full game you know obviously if you're if you're publishing a full game you have to go through you know, certain you have to have achievements, and and there's a certain kind of you know um, uh, minimum review that we go to go through, and uh, it can be you know we can't obviously accommodate every game on the platform through the ID and Xbox program. So the Creators Club is really kind of designed for people who um, you know it's a, it's a great opportunity for students who are you know learning how to make games to 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 produce something and get it up on Xbox and 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 start getting people playing it and seeing you know what the response is like. Um, if you're a uh, game developer and you have an idea and you just kind of want to like put it together and flesh it out and, and publish it quickly in a console environment, that's the way that you can do it. Um, hobbyists, enthusiasts, that kind of thing. Um, you know, if you think back to the 360 area, we had the Xbox Live Independent Games Program, which was uh, another kind of, um, uh, you know, low entry program. And we've had a number of uh, people who are now publishing games through ID at Xbox who came out of XBLIG and, and some now out of Creators Club who kind of, you know, demonstrate that they can make games and the games are fun, that people like them and that they're, they're well done. And then they kind of, you know, are able to take that expertise and that experience and, and hopefully some public enthusiasm for the game and then um, <clears throat> use that to build it into, you know, something that, that uh, uh, you know, sits you know, when they come through ID and Xbox, the, the game then sits in our ecosystem alongside every game published by EA, Activision, Ubisoft, and everybody else, you know, it's kind of um, in that same environment. So um, I think it's, you know, the main thing is if you're, um, if, if you're a person who's kind of like new to, to, to developing games, or you want to do something quickly, or you want to kind of experiment, that's a great, uh, you know, opportunity to take your, take your game to the Creators Club. Great, and um, with the Creators Club, is are then they exposed to to an instant audience to to get some uh, appraisal of their their product? Yeah, so I mean, you know, it, you know, I I don't want to kind of um, misrepresent it. I mean, the Creators Club is is located uh, in our Xbox Game Store, and there's a there's a link there to Creators Club. And then when people go in there. Um, you know, they, they find all the Creators Club uh, uh, games that are available. Um, they, they do, you know, it is a different level of exposure than if you come through ID at Xbox. Um, you know, as I mentioned, the ID at Xbox games are treated just like any other game. You know, um, Creators Club is, is in a section that's kind of um, uh, deliberately, uh, um, you know, positioned as, as kind of an experimental area because we want, we want people who uh, are interested in those kind of games to be able to find it and and, and, you know, uh, seek out new things and, and you know, and, and um, different kind of voices and that kind of thing. But it's also, you know, people on, on console um, are not necessarily, you know, um, as, uh, you know, they, they kind of expect certain things out of a game, you know, the achievements and the live operations, that kind of stuff. And so we want to make sure that there's a separate system so that people aren't confusing the two. But there is an audience for Creators Club, you know, they, people go check it out. You know, there's a lot of, um, you know, people who are very enthusiastic about games through that program. And obviously you can market your game and drive people there as well. Thank you. That's really clear. Um, I mean, the, the marketplace, uh, you know, with, with um, in general, uh, there are so many, you know, with Unity and tools that allow you now to make games so quickly. 
um, there are so many games being developed. Um, what would your advice be to studios who are trying to get their game to stand out from the crowd? Yeah, well, that's that's the million dollar question these days, isn't it? Um, literally, I think it's yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, you know, I, I, I wish there was a straight, you know, clear answer, like do this, this and this and your game will be a hit, you know, and if I if I if I had that answer clear in my head, I'd probably go and start a consulting business and be a billionaire. But, um, you know, I, I think. You know, a lot of it, from my opinion, I, I look at it from the point of view of the consumer a lot, uh, you know, as I look at people's artwork and I look at their trailers and I kind of, you know, judge like, you know, if I was going to drop my 10 bucks, 15 bucks, 20 bucks, is that the game that, that I would, you know, that would, would draw me to it? Um, and, you know, and I, I think, I think fundamentally it probably starts with the game itself. Um, if you're doing something that has a distinctive art style for, for me, I, I, the art style is something that really jumps out, you know, if something has a, has a, has a particular look to it that's different and engaging, um, that gets you a long way right there. And, you know, the obvious example of that is Cuphead and not, you know, and obviously not everybody can spend years and years cell shading every single shell in their game, you know, with that kind of level of detail and, and, uh, and quality. But, you know, something like that, when we first saw the few seconds, you know, clip of Cuphead, everybody in the room just stopped what they're doing. And they said, what, what is that? Go back to that. We need to see more of that game. And, you know, and if you're doing a game that has an art style that's very familiar, that's, you know, that, that looks like a whole lot of other games, it's that much harder to, to stand out on that basis alone. Um, but there are other things that can, can really, you know, um, jump out. I think, you know, um, when you're, game is done and you're and you're thinking about how you're going to just position it in the marketplace i'm not talking about marketing or pr outside of the ecosystem um you know it, it's probably the most obvious thing in the world but um box art is really the key when you look at a, a lineup of 60 games in a in a store lineup um if your box art doesn't stand out from the other 59 that are there in a way that is kind of engaging and compelling and interesting to the average consumer you're going to miss the opportunity for, you know, the, the 80% of the people who may not have heard of your game to just kind of click on it as they go through it. And um, it's, it's, it's amazing to me, I think, how many um, missed opportunities are because people don't really think of, you know, how their box art is going to sit in a console environment. They maybe have come from mobile or Steam or something like that, where the relationship between the customer and the screen is completely different. You know, if you're looking on a PC, you know, with a big monitor right in front of you, you see a completely different thing than if you're on a couch six feet away looking at thumbnails. And I, I think some people maybe don't, you know, envision that. Um, marketplace text is another thing. I mean, I, you know, I, I read literally every piece of marketplace text that comes through for the ID Xbox program. And there are a number of games where they, you know, I read the text and, and I get to the end of it and I'm like, I don't know what kind of game this is. I don't know what the, the you know, perspective is. I don't know, um, you know, I don't know the genre, I, you know, or, or conversely it's written, you know, this is a game about this person who does this thing and you will be, you know, that, that's something that's just kind of, you know, again, very obvious, but, um, you know, once you get people to the point where they're reading it, if they are, if you're not going to take them down the next journey, the next step in the journey, then you've kind of lost them there. Um, outside of the marketplace, you know, I mean, it's really, you know, we have these constant conversations about um, how early should you start talking about your game? You know, um, I think the the pendulum swings back and forth. At one point, everybody thought, you know, oh, three years in advance is great. And then, then it was suddenly like, oh, no, it should be three months in advance. You know, it should be like a, you know, a drive towards the... You know, funnily yeah. enough, that's one of my questions here. Um, oh, yeah. What do you think is the um, sort of optimum time for a, a studio to start marketing the game? I think it depends a little bit on 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 your approach to marketing it because the short the short run times I think can be very effective if you have a lot of ammunition that you can just fire 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 you know if you're doing uh, if you have you know budget to spend on on uh, you know going to all the events you know doing advertising you know making great trailers and getting them out there and getting top streamers playing your game that kind of thing I think that kind of igniting that fuse and then driving towards launch. Uh, can definitely work for those kind of games. Um, I think it's more challenging for uh, an indie game that's kind of struggling for um, 
exposure to begin with because you only have certain uh, vehicles that you can use. And if you're uh, cutting that time down and not using some of those vehicles, um, you're maybe missing out on some opportunities. Um, so I don't know. I would say for the average game, probably a year makes sense, you know, um, and if you're able to kind of keep engaging with your audience and build those fans and sustain buzz, um, uh, that can, that can really work well for you. You know, there's you certainly want to, you know, there's a certain seasonality to the events and the events are, um, a pretty good opportunity. And if you can take advantage of all those over the course of the year that you're promoting your product, then that's probably a, a good timeline. If you don't have the resources to go after this kind of like shotgun approach to a quick launch. Yeah, so you're you're talking about the independent developer also visiting all of the uh, the shows where they can show off their game and the consumer shows. Um, mm -hmm. What other vehicles are there? Are, are you talking about like is it wise to sort of keep a regular developer diary so and and make regular trailers so that you can uh, build your audience, build build your following? Yeah, I think so. I mean, if they're if they're you know if you don't have anything new to say, it's it's probably um you know better to kind of like build up to you know create waves rather than a whole bunch of small ripples but um i i kind of like what some you know there's there's some developers these days who are really uh engaging with the fans uh through through the streaming channels um very early and then just keeping them on board throughout the developer process i think that you kind of build that engagement in an interesting way um you know the the you know obviously streaming is a massive uh, uh vehicle these days uh you know i look at a game like uh like hello neighbor that came out last year and um they were able to uh get get very broad appeal you know youtuber support like the family youtubers early on um just based on the kind of humor of the game and the style of it and uh and i don't know what their final view tally was but it was certainly you know in the you know billion and a half or something views before they launched the game. And, you know, I, I think coming from an old school first party marketing point of view, how much money we would have paid to get a billion views for a TV commercial, <laughs> you know, and think about like how that compares to, you know, what they were able to do just through the, the humor stuff. Um, so I, you know, I, I think that that yeah, makes a, a, the, go ahead. The sorry. bulk of that was with the, the bulk of that was viral and without being paid for because of the humor. I believe so. I mean, you'd have to ask Tiny Bill, but I, I talked to him about it, and I, I don't think that they, um, I don't think they went out and paid for uh, the vast majority, and you know, uh, if any of it, um, I think it was just that their their game resonated with the kind of people. Um, you know, it's a little bit of a different reality than if you're paying for the promotion, because I think you know the content creators on the, you know, the, the streamers and the YouTubers and that kind of stuff, like they have to use content that's appealing towards their audience. So there's a certain kind of content that lets them, you know, build their show and based on their voice that works a little bit better than some other stuff. And, you know, Helen Neighbor, you know, obviously help, obviously fit that kind of um, model pretty well. And it wouldn't work for every game. But, um, you know, I, I think uh, that that it, the other side of that is if the, if the, um, the, the game creators are using that vehicle themselves, then they can control the voice a little bit more. And if you can actually bring the fans in and have them feel like they're part of the game, uh, you know, then that, that seems like a, you know, a, a pretty good way to um, uh, build that enthusiasm without spending a lot of money early on. And you'll also, I mean, candidly, you also get feedback from the fans. If they don't like what you're making, probably better for you to know two years out than to find out after you launch your game, you know, so that you can do something about it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's the sort of wonderful um, opportunity that the move towards live ops or games as a service is bringing in that you can edit your games practically in real time based on feedback, um, you know, and soon that feedback will be AI driven, you know, taken from millions of players. Uh, I'm sure you guys must be working on that kind of thing. I know Ubisoft are, um, but from your sort of like, um, sort of qualitative experience um, with people like Tiny Build. Who, who are the people that have done it really well? Can you give us some examples of like um, an ideal uh, marketing campaign, uh, particularly, you know, on, on a low budget? 
Yeah, I mean, it's always hard to, you know, pick your favorite kid, right? You know, <laughs> like I think, um, you know, yeah, I think sure. uh, there's a, I mean, you know, there, there, I think they're very different types of campaigns that are handled very differently by different publishers. And, uh, you know, I mean, you can go from one extreme, which is Play Dead, where their, their kind of campaign is, you know, one line of text and one 30 second trailer and, and, you know, everybody knows they're going to make it just a stunning, amazing game. And every time they, they open their mouth, even they barely say anything, but when every time they open their mouth, it just makes, it's like a, an earthquake. Everybody's excited for what they say. And, you know, and it's very much driven by, by less is more like you do. I mean, you know, I, I, I think you'd have a hard time finding an interview with Play Dead, you know, on the web anywhere. Um, but you know, part of that comes from the fact that their first game was so brilliant. So it's hard to it's hard to replicate that. You know, um, the, you know, uh, if you know, if I look at like you know, Tiny Bill is a great example. I think they have, um, uh, you know, they 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 pick a number of interesting projects, and then then they are very active at shows. If you've uh, been to any of the PAXs or whatever, you see their, their heavily branded orange hats and, you know, booze and everything. And people know from, you know, 600 feet away that that's Tiny Build and that, you know, they've got a certain kind of game. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know with the Hello Neighbor how much of that was, you know, catching lightning in a bottle and just getting, you know, the right people excited about it kind of coincidentally and how much that, of that they drove. Um, it's probably some of both, you know, um, but I, um, I think they're kind of, you know, they've done some interesting stuff recently that I think is pretty cool. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of different uh, ways to approach it. You know, Devolver obviously is 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 very uh, well known in the industry for um, uh, doing things in a different way and and making waves, and and um, they're pretty pretty cool to watch. You know, just to see what they're going to do. You know, when they get behind a new game. Um, you know, it's it it's hard to say. I mean, there's there's different um, levels of of scope you know depending on games too um rocket league has just done it you know a science done a genius you know um job with with rocket league making that uh uh continuing to make it relevant continuing to build audiences years after it's out um continuing to you know uh, engage with with the audiences you know from the esports side all the way to the you know marketing side you know they were running tv ads during the world cup which was you know kind of an interesting approach you know um but obviously it's a different scale of game than a lot of the games we're talking about. Yeah, thank you. And and when it comes to uh, talking to the uh, streamers and influencers, is there a particular way you'd go about approaching them? It's an interesting question because I think it's it's evolving from what I understand is evolving very quickly. Um, you know, I think there was a period, I mean, I'm sure you know this a few years ago where they were very eager for content and it was very easy to engage them and then streamers became superstars. And then at this point, uh, you have to pay a lot of them to be involved in it. And then if you're gonna do that, um, it's, you have to do the same RI calculation as you were, would a paid media campaign, um, which is very complicated. You know, there's agencies and, and that kind of thing who can help you out with that. Um, you know, I, I think from from the people I know who've been successful at it, you know, on on the kind of indie side, the best approach is to really um, pay attention to what the streamers are doing and find people who are very, you know, organically, like naturally uh, enthusiastic about the kind of game that you're making, and then engage with them early so that they feel like they're they're um, uh, you know being brought in at the ground floor, and then at that point you can kind of you know develop this relationship you know and if they're if they're they don't like the game that you're making then it, you know you're either going to have to pay them a lot of money or you're not going to get any good results and that's probably not a good one either way so i think it's really about making sure that you're approaching the right people at the right time um and then you know i think it's becoming it's more, more important is it's a kind of genre fit yeah exactly yeah and you could probably say the same thing about journalists right you know from from your point of view i did like there, there are journalists who cover every game, but there, you know, certainly if you read a lot of the, the press, uh, there are certain people who have an affinity for certain type of games. And if you can kind of identify those people and make that fit, you know, I mean, you know better than me. If you can identify and make that fit, I think you have a better chance of getting, getting, uh, getting the kind of coverage you want out of it. 
is there like a particular time of year with, that's optimum for a game to be released? I, I'm, I'm assuming that as ever Thanksgiving is, is very uh, uh, squashed in that period there. Yeah, so we, we do a lot of analysis on this. This is one of the things that, that I think um, I, I kind of am I'm proud of the idea at Xbox team for doing is that we, we go through the data every year and we look at we look at the trends and then we share this information with our developers. We're pretty open, you know, pretty open and candid about what we share. You know, we obviously don't share you know, competitive data from other games, but in terms of trends, we try and give everybody the knowledge that we have so that they can make their decisions, you know. Um, what we see is, you know, uh, probably no surprise to anybody, the period from about September to um, end of November uh, tends to be really bad for digital games in general. Um, and, you know, the, the reason is pretty obvious, the share of um, mind share, share of wallet, share of voice and all that is being eaten up by these massive games with, you know, uh, multi-million dollar marketing budgets and lots of retail exposure and, and it's very hard for other games to break out. And I have this conversation with at least half a dozen every year, half a dozen people every year where they say, I'm going to counter program. I'm going to be the one indie game that's going to come out the same day as Red Dead Redemption and all the people who don't play Red Dead will buy my game. And with very few exceptions, that never works, you know, because it's really just, you know, gamers are not, you know, I think that we go through this uh, analysis of like, you know, oh, is that guy a racing gamer? Is that guy a shooter gamer? Is that guy a strategy gamer? And reality gamers aren't like that, you know, they, you know, there's many people who play racing games who also play shooters, also play sports games, you know, um, as, as anything else. So um, if people are if the entire ecosystem is focused on one thing at a particular time, they're never going to, you're never going to be able to carve people away from that. Um, so that's kind of a long winded way of saying Q4 tends to be bad. December has worked out well for us over the past few years. Um, there's like a window between when the retail games kind of start petering out and before the big end of year sales hit, uh, where I think uh, there's a lot of people who are engaged in the ecosystem, maybe kind of interested in what's next. Um, January, February, March are really interesting because they, the overall sales volume in that quarter, Q1, uh, outside of free-to-play, which is a little bit of a different reality, um, the overall sales volume um, is smaller, so the pie is smaller, but traditionally there are fewer releases there, so you, you, we, we've actually seen some pretty good success come out of that, that period. Uh, this year, 2019, I think is going to be different so because if, you, if your project's late, you're still in with a chance. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Um, you know, it's a, you know, I think I think outside of Q4, you know, Q2 tends to be pretty strong. Um, uh, in, you know, April and May, June is a softer month. The, the whole summer is softer um, in general. August is a really good month for sales for digital games generally. Um, you know, we've historically run the summer spotlight program to highlight the new digital releases in August to take it. And is that just because all the kids are on holiday? Yeah, I think, I think it's just, um, you know, um, it's the period that kind of captures that, that period right before, um, after the summer doldrums and right before the big retail titles hit. But the flip side of that is everybody seems to know that now and there are a ton of games that come out in august so it's becoming more of a competitive window than it used to be so you kind of there's never there's never any clear answer you're always a little bit you know yeah is. yeah of course well it's the nature of a hit driven industry i suppose isn't it? yeah yeah if you're the 800 pound gorilla you can sit wherever you want what percentage of a studio's budget do you recommend or or would you using your experience would you say was work for indies how much should they set aside? I mean, it's a big question. Depends on the size of your title and stuff like that, I'm sure. But. You know, I think, uh, you know, we you'd normally look at somewhere around 10, 20%, but I, it varies it varies so much depending on scope and and and, uh, uh, and your objectives really, like, you know, because I think you can spend a lot of money very um, inefficiently and, and, you know, um, it doesn't it doesn't really uh, help you that much. I think you know if you look at the uh, depending on the, again the scope of your game, you know the the the, the kind of you know micro targeting approaches and that kind of thing. I think are probably a better better use of your money. But um, for the average uh, title, I would spend that money. Um, uh, you know, first of all, making sure that your assets 
you know, your box shot, your trailers, that kind of thing, are really can just sit there side by side with the the best of the stuff that you see from Activision, EA, and Newbie, and Warner, and everybody else. Um, you know, because if, if not, nobody's going to buy your game. Um, and then, you know, there, there are things like, uh, you know, micro-targeting ads on Facebook, you know, um, where you can get an extremely efficient spend. Um, you know, you can spend money on our, on, on advertising on console dashes, that kind of thing, if you want, um, which obviously you're speaking directly to the customer. But um, I, I kind of like the idea of maximizing the free opportunities as much as possible and then kind of saving the, the, the marketing spend for, you know, um, uh, uh, the real kind of difficult things to get. What would those difficult things be? Well, um, so part of it would be, you know, streaming is such a big driver of sales these days. If you really, you know, are not getting traction with the streamers and you need to spend money there, maybe that's something that's worthwhile. Um, depending on the scope of your game, I think it can be very difficult to, uh, to if you haven't published before, like breaking into the kind of PR cycle and getting, getting the attention of the, um, the top influencers and the top uh, sites to actually cover your game can be um, uh, not as easy as just sending, sending them a code. I mean, obviously we try and help out on our end. We distribute codes for, um, for our games, but you know, working with a PR agency that has a particular uh, focus and enthusiasm for games of your size and genre um, is probably a worthwhile spend depending on, depending on your game. Um, and then, you know, I, I think uh, other than some of the micro-targeting stuff I mentioned, advertising is probably not a good spend for most indie games. You know, you really, uh, the, the efficiency of that spend is probably going to be low. Um, but, you know, I think, I think kind of those areas would, would, you know, where you're kind of putting the money directly on something that's going to be drive, you know, as, as close to the actual customer as you can is probably worthwhile doing. Um, events are definitely, I, I well, in the grand scheme of thing, I think events uh, tend to work out pretty well for for a lot of uh, a lot of games. Just you know, as you're building that kind of enthusiasm over a year, um, the best way to do it is to be in somebody else's booth where you're not managing everything yourself and not paying for it. If you can, you know, accomplish that, you know, by all means, go for it. But um, aside from that, if you have to pay for that too, it's probably worthwhile. Yeah, thank you. I mean, over here in England, uh, often the the international board of trade will uh, pay for developers to have that booth space. Um, I'm, I'm sure it's not as freely available in America. Yeah, I think, I, you know, yeah, the, I, I see a lot of those uh, regional booths, you know, if there, if there's, well, I think, one from ANZ and Poland and Russia and Nordics and all that, that's definitely a good opportunity. I don't know exactly how those work, but um, I imagine if you can, like any, any of those or any of the kind of you know, obviously the platform holders, we always have um, booths at most major events and we show a number of games and, and, you know, there's a lot of competition for those spots, but if you can, if you can get in there, then we manage everything for you and it's totally free. Um, if you can get in through one of your trade organizations, that's fantastic as well. You know, and then there's any mega booth and those kind of things as well, which are a great opportunity. Yeah, thank you. And what does the uh, Idea Xbox team do for games being released uh, on the platform? Yeah, so there's there's probably uh, direct stuff and indirect stuff that we do. Um, the direct stuff is pretty uh, pretty straightforward. Um, we use all of our social channels and our and our you know community channels. We'll, we'll um, tweet out the game through ID through the ID Xbox uh, accounts. We'll stream it. Uh, Major Nelson, uh, Larry Erb, he's a great supporter of our program, so he will um, almost always do a launch tweet and a launch blog post, and um, we can frequently get the games included in his, uh, or the This Week on Xbox program that they run. Um, we run all games in the new releases channel, which is a pretty, um, pretty significant channel for people who are looking for new games to buy, so, you know, you're kind of most, most, uh, uh, low hanging fruit customer. So being featured in there and, you know, and, and, um, uh, adjusting your launch timing to make sure that you maximize your exposure in there is, is, is pretty important. And we can help you out with, um, figuring out how to maximize your exposure there. Um, and you know, those are kind of the, uh, uh, you know, most obvious things that we do consumer facing things. There's a lot of kind of behind the scenes stuff that the developers may never see in terms of, uh, internal advoc advocacy, 
So we make sure that everybody on the Mixer team, everybody on the Game Pass team, everybody on our, you know, our PR teams and our extended uh, subsidiary organizations is aware of what games are coming out through ID to Xbox. You know, we have kind of newsletters that we send out internally and, and, um, and internal advocacy programs where we, where we kind of try and hype up the games uh, just in general for all games, but then particularly the ones that, that um, you know, have something special about them or that we're excited about. Um, and then that can create a lot of other opportunities on the side that people, um, you know, wouldn't normally, you know, be able to access. Um, you know, uh, so, you know, that, that kind of stuff, I think, um, uh, in general can kind of build a little bit of internal buzz. And then that translates into things like when we reach out to press and all that, we'll highlight the games, you know, that we, um, that, that come through the program. You know, we do uh, a weekly posting, you know, next week on Xbox that, that uh, goes on our Xbox wire and that we distribute out to um, most major press outlets and a lot of influencers. You know, we give codes for um, the ID to Xbox games to, I think about 200 um, uh, top tier press and, uh, you know, in the Xbox community and influencers. Um, and we can distribute another bunch to top tier streamers, you know, and mixer partners, that kind of thing as well. Thank you. That's that's uh, quite a lot of support that you're providing. Um, I'm sure our audience will really uh, appreciate that aspect. Um, you mentioned the Games Pass, the, the Xbox Game Pass. Uh, mm -hmm. It's new, right? And um, how, how have people responded to that? And, and what is it exactly, please? Yeah, so Game Pass, yeah, I think it's about a year old, a little, uh, maybe like 15 months old, something like that. So. Um, Basically, it's a subscription service. We pay a, a, a monthly fee or a yearly fee, and then you can access um, over 100 games. I think it's about 120 or something right now. Um, and uh, these games uh, are available for download, and uh, so it's not like a streaming service where you need some crazy gigabit Ethernet uh, internet to access them. Um, and it's a fantastic uh, uh, program for, from my point of view, from the customer because there's, you know, how many times have you looked at a game and you're like, ah, that game looks kind of interesting, but I'm not quite over the hump on it. Um, so I, for me, and I play all the IDX Xbox games, so it's not like I have any lack of games to play, but, um, you know, there are a lot of games where I've gone through and I've been able to kind of discover uh, older games that I haven't, you know, um, haven't had a chance to check out through Game Pass. Um, <clears throat> for our partners, um, I, I think it creates a, uh, an opportunity for, you know, particularly back catalog games that have kind of, you know, maybe run their course on the store, but then, you know, um, they go into Game Pass and you get all of the, you know, first of all, they get, you know, you, 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 you'll get, um, uh, there's a business relationship around being in Game Pass, so you get money from that. But then also you have all the people who are Game Pass subscribers who are playing the game. Um, and they are sharing achievements and sharing screenshots and sharing video clips through their community feed, which show up in the, uh, on the dash to all their friends. And, um, in a lot of cases, we've seen that, uh, games that, you know, have, have been, uh, fairly dormant for a while will go into Game Pass and suddenly they see this re-engagement and, uh, within the Game Pass and then outside of Game Pass too, uh, new people checking it out, buying DLC and playing them. So it's been, uh, been pretty pretty interesting from that perspective you know um and uh you know i think there's a lot of opportunity particularly for certain genres of games uh going forward and with that kind of model and you know we're we're still even though it's been about a year we're still in relatively early stages in terms of uh determining how we maximize the opportunity for um for the partners and we're having a lot of open conversations with it and, and the um the feedback from our, our dev partners has been uh, been fantastic so far, just candidly. I mean, we've you know people have been very excited about it. Yeah, that's great. Um, and are are they uh, taking um, a, lot, a lot less in terms of like the uh, the money that the developer will receive themselves back from the game, uh, but they they it makes up for it in volume. No, I mean it's so it's. I, uh, it, it would be a little inappropriate for me to get into the specifics on how uh, how the royalties work because we don't really we don't really talk about that publicly. Um, I, you know what I can say is it it uh, you know the 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 devs who have gone into the program have been have been really happy with it. You know they've been they've seen the you know the benefit of um, you know the, the not only the kind of you know business relationship that we have for putting their game in there, but then the benefit of additional sales outside of the program and DLC and you know, and then just exposing um, people to their franchises and that kind of thing. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, so I know we have to wrap up, um, but can you give us your top three tips for launching a game before we go? Yeah, um, so I would say, first of all, make sure that uh, uh, you're aware of what the, you know, that you're, you're cognizant of the timing of your game. Um, and that's everything from the launch timing, you know, what month you're picking to the launch day that you're picking. And then also um, taking care of all of the, 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 you know, getting the game set up and, and ready to launch and all that in an appropriate manner so that you're leaving space to, to market the game. Um, you know, in other words, don't crash land right into your launch and then, you know, try and chase it three weeks later with, with your marketing. Um, the second is, uh, I mentioned before, and it's probably the most obvious thing in the world, but I can't, I can't emphasize it enough, is just make sure that you are really thinking about how your game shows up in the store, the box art, the key art, the game description. Um, if you don't come from a console publishing environment, um, you know, really kind of step back from your, from your other reality on Steam or mobile and say, you know, okay, how is this game showing up on the console and how can I adjust things to make sure that I'm taking advantage of that opportunity? Um, and then the third thing is really think about the entire life cycle of your product from, you know, your, your um, uh, build up to launch into your pre-order program, into your launch, and then how are you going to be managing the life cycle of the game over two years, three years even. Um, because you're probably, um, for a lot of games, you're gonna sell as many units or not more units in your second year as you will your first year. And a lot of that is through maximizing your exposure through discounting programs and, and other kind of post-launch promotional programs. And I'm, I'm shocked at how many like really competent, you know, solid uh, 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 publishers, you know, um, indie publishers, don't think about that. And I have to go out there and rattle their chain and say, you know, what are you doing with discounting? How, you know, let's talk about that, you know, and uh, it, it's, it's really a, a something that you should be thinking about and planning about and you know, planning for even before you launch your game. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I've been very intrigued about the, the number of games you play. Uh, what are you playing at the moment? Boy, uh, so right before we got on this call, I was playing a game called The Moose Man. Uh, which comes from, uh, uh, I believe it's a Russian developer uh, called uh, Sometimes You. Sometimes You. Yeah, yeah, they're a Russian developer. And uh, it's an idea of Xbox game. I hadn't heard anything about it until I saw it come through the, uh, through the process. And uh, it, it's, it's a really interesting puzzle game that it tells this, uh, I, um, these kind of traditional Russian folk stories through this kind of artistic interface thing, which... Uh, you know, it's it's a it's it's a, it's a smaller game, but I, I thought it was just kind of interesting, and so I picked it up, and started playing it, and kind of have been jamming through it. Um, I played um, uh, quite a bit of Nidhogg 2, uh, which launched on Xbox this week. Um, really, like, I'm not I'm not a great kind of like you know uh, fighting game beat 'em up type game uh, uh, player, but uh, their mechanic of the kind of chase thing back and forth is just really fun like i said so much fun playing that um and then i played a game last night called the path of modus which is a um a small game uh that uh i, I don't mean small in terms of size i mean it's it's got this uh kind of uh unique voice to it and that's a kid who's exploring uh bullying through this game mechanic you know and they're kind of teaching kids how to uh wow. how to deal with bullying, which i thought was uh Pretty interesting, yeah. Called Path of Modus, I think it launched this week as well, too, a couple of days ago. Yeah, that sounds great. It's great that you know, games are really starting to tackle the real issues that we have in life. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for your time. I really have appreciated uh, the insight into the program, and I'm sure our audience are going to pick up uh, plenty of uh, good reminders of what to do before the submission. Thank you so much. Great. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much for having me. It's been fun.